Okay, so um, my name is Loren. Um, I am, yeah, talking to you from uh, Dordogne, which is a region in France um, with a lot of hills and uh, forests. And usually it's rather humid and cold. And um, today we're the 29th of uh, October. It's 29 degrees outside. Um, the trees are still green. They dry, but the leaves, they don't turn yellow or red. Uh, yesterday, a little bit later in the day, it was like a sort of yellowish light and the atmosphere is very thick and everything is quite strange. So maybe, uh, maybe it's a good day to speak about hope. Um, so I am 26. I grew up in the Paris area and uh, after school, I went to creative studies. Um, as I didn't have a specific sector in mind, uh, I thought that the general side of uh, fine arts would suit, would suit me. I did a bachelor degree in uh, fine arts in Lyon and uh, indeed it uh, really suited me. I discovered basically that uh, material could be vector of the world and I did a lot of projects that uh, fascinated me. But uh, in fine arts, I think especially in France, creative, creative freedom has a cost because there is a strong pressure on the ability to justify these projects and give them legitimacy through words. And uh, after three years, I think the atmosphere waited on me because the attention is strongly focused on one's mental world in search of relevance and originality. And uh, personally, I believe that <clears throat> mental world is limited and um, words are not so important and they're not determining the relationship that is created, created between the artist and the material. And this is one of the reasons why I needed to leave fine arts. And uh, I went to the design academy. I joined the contextual design section, which is a bit special uh, because the relationship to creation, it's uh, very similar to fine arts. Uh, in contextual design, the research is rooted on the, the personal universe, the imagination, the lived experience, etc. And um, for me, a project that comes out of the contextual design section is a sort of hybrid forms between sculpture and design. So that's why I was attracted by the contextual design section and also the word design, because I thought that it would allow me to sort of frame my work. I thought I had developed a sort of aesthetic language in fine arts and that I would be able to um, find it a concrete application in the world through design. And in fact, it's the complete opposite that happened. In contextual design, more than ever, I made sculpture. Um, I completely lost my interest in the question of application or use. Maybe because I believe that today we don't need no more things. And uh, the subjects I want to, to talk about, I think they are best uh, embodied in autonomous forms and sculpture. In fact, I understood that what was the most important for me in the shapes, it's their presence and it's their strength and nothing else. Um, now that I've talked a bit about my work, uh, no, about my background, I will talk about my work. And uh, so I will be honest with you, it's a bit difficult what I go through when I'm asked to talk about my work because I kind of feel like I try to put into words something that doesn't really belong to the realm of words. And uh, I don't really have a conceptual way of thinking. Um, my own human thoughts at some time, hard time grasping all that is going on behind the shapes I produce, but I will try to put some markers that helps you understanding my work. So there are two themes that are very important in my work towards which I oriented myself from the very first month in fine arts, which is the carcass and the remain. So carcass first, very quickly, I looked at uh, fossils, skeletons, snake molds, empty shells, stranded whales, 
but also abandoned tractors, fragments of dismantled machines, and extra. The carcass for me is something that has known a rise and a decline. And uh, I could formulate it differently and say that a carcass has been inhabited and then abandoned by life. Like a shipwreck or a rune or a dead tree, it's a carcass. Creation, living, abandonment. It's a cycle and the carcass is the last stage. It's when the shape disappears in silence and it is at this very stage that the shape attracts me. The second theme that feeds me, it's the remain. Um, it's not completely different, but it's not quite the same either. So since I've been making sculpture, I've been looking a lot at archeological objects or ancient objects. I'm much more familiar with the collections of the Metropolitan Museum, for example, than the exhibitions of the Palais de Tokyo, I admit. Um, I brew a panel of objects, which is rather broad, uh, fetishes, paintings, prints, tapestries, objects, potteries. I stroll in all cultures with nevertheless a strong tension towards the vestige that comes from before our era. So it's much more lively to me, uh, for me to go digging into things from the past than contemporary shapes. It's a very intuitive behavior, but when I think about it, I find several, several reasons for that. Um, first of all, because before industrial era, objects are more transparent. You understand uh, how and what they're made of. It makes them more human. I like to feel the gesture. I like to feel the presence of the human sensitivity. I like raw materials. The idea of movement, whether it's a movement of the human hand or the material itself, it's very important to me. I think it brings life to the object. It, it becomes more real. Speaking of gesture, I'm particularly sensitive to primary gestures. Uh, on Google Art Culture Timeline, I often go to the extreme left side, uh, and a bit less now, but especially at the beginning of my work, I looked a lot at also tribal and voodoo shapes. Proof of this, uh, the very first project I did in uh, fine arts were much more uh, tribal inspired. I think I strongly believe in uh, the idea of collective memory. I will not dwell on this notion for lack of theoretical support, but it's also why primary gesture and also remains are important for me. And finally, archeological objects, they, be they belong to another time. And they are somehow on the edge of the contemporary world and its cacophony. And this is also why and maybe that's also the main reason why they, they attract me. The question of silence is very important for me. I think I fantasize the existence of a space on the edge, far from the flow of human thoughts, mine or those of others, where there is a deep silence. And uh, I believe that in this space with such silence, I could find myself far from the permanent urge of the living, from my, my, from my permanent urge, and that I could sort of finally see what binds me deeply to the world. And I believe the role I give to my sculpture is being vector of this deep silence. Even though I could never create such a space, I believe I can produce uh, emanations of it. And the head series is one of them. This week I was preparing for the presentation of the project and uh, I went back to its origin and talking about the head is uh, harder than I thought because there is quite a lot of things behind these shapes, but I'm gonna try. I'm talking about a series of, I don't remember the exact number, but there are about 50 pieces in total. Um, the idea, it came from a Brancusi, Brancusi species that I love, which are the muses. I love them firstly because I see in these faces uh, of this sleeping woman, a sort of 
delicacy that creates a real contrast with the feeling of their weight and their silhouette that reminds me of a pebble. And a pebble is interesting because it's also abandoned. Uh, it's abandoned to the movement of waves. Its existence is punctuated by the swell, which makes it roll on the beach from the bottom to the top. It is polished by the sea, and in a way it's carried by a motion that leads it to disappear little by little. Rancuzzi's muses made me want to make pieces between the head and the stone, between something that is both, both a passive mass and a presence. I immediately thought of uh, the heads of farm animals, because when I look at the muses, I imagine the artist carrying these heavy pieces with a kind of tenderness, with a sort of delicate att attention. And I wanted to give the same tenderness to the head of a sheep, of a cow, or a goat. Maybe I'm making a connection between, uh, between the pebble that I was talking about earlier and the farm animal in the way that they are a bit tossed about, they are a bit passive, their movements are dictated by the farmer and his dogs. The herds let themselves be carried by the rhythm of the farm and I find it touching. The livestock is a subject which often comes back in my ideas. Um, the process, it was a bit voodoo. <laughs> uh, so what you see here are mattresses from which I made the molds. And the heads are first molded shapes that I, I would rework afterwards. I had better pictures before, but since my phone died, uh, it's, it's everything I have. Um, so, yeah, I had 14 molds uh, from which I made the basic shapes to which I added horns and bumps and holes to evoke a nose, an eye. It was a bit of a game where the goal was to sort of give life to these ovoid shapes taken out of the molds. And I quickly understood that where the most things were happening was in the holes and the cracks. And I had a lot of pleasure making the holes, making the cavities, because it's interesting to realize the power of a simple hole in a shape. Uh, I still have a strong image in my mind that gives a good idea of the process. So I was working cross-legged position on the floor and I had the head in the middle of my legs. And uh, with one hand, I held it very gently, not to distort the still uh, malleable clay. And with the other head, hand, I would press my fingernail into it to purse it and make an eye appear. And while doing this, I thought of the lambs that we tranquilize with a caress right before cutting their throats. And I, I liked the tension between a raw gesture and a tender gesture. Um, I would like to say one last thing about this project, which opens up another dimension. And I will end the presentation with that. Um, I was talking earlier about my relationship to archaeological objects, and I brew a lot of museum collections. <clears throat> when I find something I love, I keep it. I save it or I screen capture it. And I have quite a few folders in my computer called Objects of Yesterday. And if tomorrow the motherboard of my computer were to fail and take all the data stored on it with it, these folders, they would be the first thing I would regret to have lost. I have a mini sub collection that was put together long before the idea of the head project, it's miniature animals. For the mattresses, I was inspired by the head shapes of these small objects. And um, as they are old, the time has sometimes damaged them a bit. And uh, I like the fact that the shapes sometimes because almost become almost abstract, but never totally erasing the animal. And in fact, the head, they do not really evoke the cow or the goat in itself, but as we imagine it, as we represent them. And also perhaps, especially, they speak about the animal of our childhood and the miniature character with which we used to tell stories. If the form are today silent masses, maybe before they were part of the game, they were part of a game and maybe they were animated by a joy of which there is still a trace. 
I am obsessed with the idea that joy and play and celebration leave traces. If there is something left of the living after its disappearance, then there must remain something of its pulse, of its lightness. The image of a carnival where life beats freely is very present in my imagination, but it's always far, far away in space and time. Um, for example, if someone says fair to me, I always, I immediately think of the feeling of a fair that is watched from afar. So you can hear the, I hear the echo or I see the colorful lights fading into the night. But I'm in a field a few hundred meters away, surrounded by silent, silence and darkness. And I'm very interested in this image. Far away, life and joy chase the darkness and silence. It's a small source of energy and vivacity that is drawn into something immense. immense. And at the moment, I'm working on a series of ceramic sculptures that is a good uh, example of this tension. So I love drums. I have the impression that this shape was very present in my childhood. And uh, it often appears in books, in toys, movies. The drums has a place in brass bands, cyrus, parades. It is music, noise, show, party, vivacity. And at the moment, I'm working on a series of two-tone ceramic cylinders that takes up the triangular pattern of the drums. The sculpture, they will be mineral, cold, heavy, and brittle. No skin to create sound, just the air passing on both sides of the cylinder. Vectors of silence again. But they will still have something of the drum. They will still have something of the party. I call them uh, drum fossils. For the moment, the project is only at the stage where I have like three buckets filled with hundred color tests. Uh, I spend a lot of time searching for the colors and the materials. Uh, for the heads, I, I also did this. Is this all to say that party is over or that there will always remain something of it? In fact, I believe it's both. Um, yeah, today uh, we're talking about hope. I think maybe before I need hope, before I want to expect something for myself or for the world, I would like to be deeply aware of what is dying. And that's what I'm obsessed with shapes that are in tension between the, un the uninhabited and the inhabited, between life and death. I believe that they are necessary. They are necessary because if the living is vulnerable, I forget it. I forget that what exists today will no longer exist tomorrow. And when I remember this, then, yeah, my way of looking at the world changes. It's filled with love. And I see the beauty of things because I also see their fragility. I don't know, maybe, maybe love is a needed strength. Maybe we need strength to face uh, the changes to come. And I hope it will be another kind of strength than the one that comes from fear. Yeah, that's it. Lorraine, it is wonderful to meet you. <laughs> I first met your work. Thank you so Thank you for listening to me. to me so much. So therefore, we. Um, uh, acquired it for the collection as the, that was the first new acquirement, you know, which is very symbolic, I think. So it's very wonderful that you are in that room, which is all dedicated to memory and archaeology. It's on, on par with Hella Junkeri's work. It's, uh, it's quite amazing to be there. And I'm very moved by your presentation and I'm uh, even more pleased that I uh, discovered your work and your person. And I hope to be able to um, follow what you're doing. And uh, thank you so much. Deeply. Thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> it means a lot for me to be, uh, to be part of this uh, exhibition. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't have words. <laughs> okay. but, yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. Thank you. Okay.